Welcome to Proclaiming Justice, a podcast from PJTN that focuses the light of truth on vital issues in today's headlines that impact every American. I'm your host, Laurie Cardoza Moore, founder and president of Proclaiming Justice to the Nations, and I'm here to educate, motivate, and activate you to action. I want to arm you with the truth and the facts you'll need to fight and preserve our constitutional republic and uphold the Judeo-Christian values our nation was founded upon. Welcome to Proclaiming Justice, a PJTN podcast where we shine the light of biblical truth on vital issues from today's headlines that impact every American, Jew and Christian, people of faith and people of conscience. I'm your host, Laurie Cardoza Moore. On this week's podcast, I've invited Rabinit Yaffa Bacha de Costa back on the podcast. She is the founder and CEO of Ezrael Anusim. She's currently writing a book titled The Puzzle of Calling a Dog's Tail a Leg, Cancel Culture from Ancient to Modern Times, which she plans to publish by the end of this calendar year. The website of her organization is b'neianusim.org. That's spelled B-N-E-I-A-N-O-U-S-I-M dot org. And her email address where you can reach her is yafa, yaf, batya at yahoo.com. That's Y-A-F-F-B-A-T-Y-A at yahoo.com. If you missed the last episode of this podcast, you will want to find it and and listen to it and our previous podcast lineups on our website at pjtn.org, as well as all the other platforms that you use to access your favorite podcasts. I also want to remind you that it's important for you to listen and share this and all of our previous podcasts with your family and friends so that they can become more informed about this and other related issues that threaten our republic and the state of Israel. So please remember to like and share. On our last podcast, we discussed the origins of the modern cancel culture and anti-Semitism, and it was amazing. So again, please go back and listen to that show. It is an eye-opener. Just as we are witnessing the silencing of people with different views and values today, the Greco-Roman church canceled individuals and sects who had a different belief or understanding of the scriptures. And we are again watching that unfold today. And I want to thank Yafa Batya de Costa for joining us back on the show again, because this topic of cancel culture and its history, especially when it comes to Christianity and its canceling, this is not a this is not a new thing, is it? Yafa, this has been around for centuries. Oh, absolutely. It's been around and around and around. I mean, it it, actually, it it never really stopped. From the Roman period of Caesar Augustus, who was the first emperor of what's called the Roman imperial cult, which actually came about after a republic, by the way. There was a republic before that, okay? Okay. But there were so many wars and so many fighting and so many arguments and whatever. That's what history shows us is Mm -hmm. that what you can have after that, because people get so tired of it, okay, is an autocratic ruler. It's also called totalitarianism. I'm just talking off the top of my head here, okay? But that's what started with Caesar Augustus. And then it, it kept on for hundreds of years with the other Caesars or which we call Roman emperors. And so it has a long history because they were very, they felt very threatened in mm-hmm. the Roman imperial cult. And they had their gods, which were Greco-Roman, as right. you mentioned, it's, it's Greek and Roman together. Mm-hmm. And so they had their gods and their protocols and their practices and all that. And it was actually considered treasonous in the Roman empire to not do those things, to not burn incense to an image of the emperor and to not bow down and worship the emperor or a previous emperor who had died and then they declared declared him to be a god after he had died they built temples Mm -hmm. to these people who at one point 
had a lot of power. Mm -hmm. And so it was perceived that after they died, they continued to have enormous power. Mm -hmm. And for the sake of the Roman Empire and its success in whatever it was doing, you know, fighting the Parthians or whatever, whatever, okay, that was a part of every Roman citizen's job, if you mm -hmm. will, to go to the festivals and do these various, as I said, customs and practices and whatever. And so it was considered treasonous, actually, to mm -hmm. not do that. So the earliest Christians, the people in Antioch, who were being taught by Paul. Now, Paul was a Jew, okay, as mm -hmm. you know. So they were Philo-Semites, as we said last week, and they wanted to be close to the God of Israel. They were learning mm -hmm. from Paul. They believed in the one God, and they were no longer pagans, even if they had been before. Mm -hmm. They were no longer going to do any of this stuff, and that's what got them fed to the lions. Most people don't know this. Mm. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because we talk about cancel culture and really the ultimate goal of the cancel culture is to silence the um, dissenting opinions or people that don't share the same value system that the those who are part of that cancel culture share. And now we, you know, looking back, because I never would have thought to look back historically, cancel culture in my lifetime, I mean, I'm 60 years old, and I've never heard the term cancel culture used. So to me, when I hear cancel culture, I'm thinking, this is kind of a new thing that's come up. But you're saying it's not new. It's actually, historically, it's been around for a long, long time. So, but you give us an example of, give our audience an example of the cancel culture today and the cancel culture of the, um, the early Roman period or the Roman period um, when the Romans took over Israel. Or, of course, at that time, they renamed it Palestine or Palestina. Give us an example. It was Judea, actually, biblical Judea, that they occupied, okay, the Romans did, right. under the Roman emperor. And so I'll give you a modern-day example. You've heard of Kanye West, mm. right? Oh, who wants yes. To be called, who now wants to be called Ye, okay, yes. from Kanye, shortened his name. So... He's a, he's a great singer. Maybe he's also a songwriter. I'm not sure, but he's gotten a lot of awards in the music industry and he has, you know, franchises and all kinds of stuff. Very, very wealthy guy, African-American. And he's come out with some incredibly anti-Semitic statements, which caused a lot of his partners like Adidas and some of the other um firms that wanted him as a spokesperson, whatever, to cancel their contracts with him because right. of these anti-Semitic statements. And then recently in Los Angeles, there was there's this highway in LA called the 405. And there were banners, huge, huge banners hanging down from this overpass over the 405 in LA. And one of the banners said, Kanye is right about the Jews. Mm, okay. Yeah. And another one is quoting John 8, 44 and Revelation 3, verse 9. Now, those are first century writings, very, very late period first century. Very late. Okay. And then you have the second century to the early fourth century as a period of Lots of different views and sects and groups and mm -hmm. organizations, okay, that argued with each other and had dialogue and discourse about this and that and the other. And who was the Galilean really? And what does he represent? And there's this thing called Christology, which mm -hmm. is the study of Christ, the nature and being of Christ or Messiah, mm -hmm. as we say in English, from mm -hmm. the Hebrew word Mashiach which simply mm -hmm. means anointed one, okay? So you have right. to kind of unpack all of that. But the point is, Rome won. And as they say, the winner, they're talking about winners of wars or arguments, whatever, the winner writes history. That's right. So mm -hmm. Rome won. 
against Carthage and against Alexandria and against Palestine, you know, the bishops in, mm -hmm. in Jerusalem, whatever, of the early church. Okay, because there were these, all these communities. And the modern day scholars, what a lot of people don't understand is, these are Christian scholars, by the way. Mm -hmm. The modern day Christian scholars today now have the documents that were found in Qumran, which are called the Dead Sea Scrolls. Right. And they also have the documents that were found in Egypt out of what's called the Nag Hammadi Library of ancient scrolls. Mm -hmm. And so they have fragments and even whole cloth, you know, if you will, documents of that period of the first century that's shedding new light on all of this, what was going on in the first century and why there was so much discussion, disagreement and mm -hmm. taking things out of context in some cases, reinterpretation or misinterpretation of things in other cases. And eventually what happened was when Constantine decided he wanted to become a Christian, okay? He wanted to unify the empire because again, under pagan gods, there were a lot of different gods and they would fight with each other and their wives would fight with each other. And I don't mean to make fun, but it, the people of that day were getting tired of it, okay? Mm -hmm. So he wanted to rally the entire Roman empire with this idea of one God, mm -hmm. one and only one God as a unifier. And he chose Christianity. But in the meantime, over these 200 years or 300 years or so, and all of these discussions and arguments, whatever, he wanted that to get stopped because he didn't want to have the same kind of battles going on in this Christian now Roman Empire. Right. Like what was going on before under the pagans, because there were multiple gods. So what did he do? He called the Council of Nicaea. And he said, essentially, all right, y'all, <laughs> fix it. <laughs> I That's want right. one. That's I right. Want one, I want one God, and I want one definition of this one God. <laughs> okay. And they came up with the Nicene Creed. Now, the bottom line is not all of Christianity or people who considered themselves Christians at that time agreed with the Nicene Creed. And of course, the Jews certainly didn't. And we can talk about that why. But they lost to the Romans who decided on the Nicene Creed, okay, mm -hmm. through slaughter, through cancel culture, through canceling them, through discriminating against them, through causing them to shut up, essentially, right. or we'll kill you, or we'll kill mm -hmm. you. And that's mm -hmm. what they did. That's how they won. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, um, great analogy using the whole Kanye West um, issue, because now we're seeing, even in some of his comments, it was very disturbing, and we had put out a statement about it last week, um, condemning his con his comments, but to see how he even tried to delegitimize, cancel the Jews from Europe by saying, suggesting that only black Jews were real Jews in his statement, which we which leads us to the black Israelite movement. We see this growing trend, and this group, this trend is actually using cancel culture to try to target Jews, to try to delegitimize them. I was speaking at a, a um, conservative group, a Tea Party group, a couple of weeks ago, and a couple stood up, and this is not the first time this happened, but they pulled their cancel culture on me, trying to cancel me out in front of all these people who came to hear me. This is a, a community. This is an organization I have spoken to for probably six years now. They invite me back. Um, they are the Tea Party. They are a Tea Party group. They are comprised um, of Christians and this couple stood up and started challenging me because I support Israel and I stand with the Jews. And out of their mouth came the biggest cancel culture, and that was trying to delegitimize the, the, the Jewish people by, um, by stating that the Jews are all, you know, they're the ones who are creating this problem. They control the media. Well, of course, my response to them controlling the media is a lot like what Brad Stein, um, who we um, had do the 
boycott this documentary. He was the, we cast him in it. And he made a great comment for Jews to be the ones who are um, trying to uh, uh, launch apartheid or take rights from other people, um, control the media. They're the ones creating all, all these problems. You know, for, for Jews being rulers and controlling the media, they do a poor job of doing it because the media is not friendly to the Jews and to Israel. We see that over and over and over in the rhetoric that is put out by mainstream media. It's typically the conservative media um, that is not trying to cancel out Israel and the Jewish people. So, you know, that's exactly right. Well, then this couple started in about them controlling Hollywood. And again, my response to them about their control of Hollywood is, look at all the wonderful films that the Jews have been involved in creating. Look at the Marvel heroes. You know, that's as Americana and as American as apple pie. And But we want to blame the Jews for the, the pornography that is coming out of L.A. We're accusing them of creating all the pornography. And, of course, my final statement to, to this couple was, you know, the Jewish community comprises of just over 1% of the world's population. And they do not, even in elections, because it, it, I feel this frenzy, Yaffa, starting to build up of anti-Semitism, and it's frightening. And because we're in the situation politically, at least here in the United States of America, everybody wants to blame a scapegoat. And who's getting the blame? It's the Jews. And even if the majority of American Jewry support Democrats, vote for Biden, they can't affect the elections. Just the sheer lack of numbers. It's the Christians. And so, of course, I said to the guy, I said, you know, you're attacking the Jews, you know, suggesting that they're the ones that are keeping us in this oppressed state. Well, I'm sorry to tell you, but the Christians have the numbers we, if we showed up and voted, we would be able to have the right people in office. But do we? No. But we're going to, we're, again, we've got to have a scapegoat. It's got to be the Jews. So we're going to focus on canceling out the Jews, canceling out Israel. Well, here's the thing. Years ago, I remember a case, an incident that happened about abortion. And um, there was a, I think it was a man, pretty sure it was a man, who went to some city in America to shoot up uh, people in an abortion clinic, mm -hmm. okay, because of being against abortion. Now, not immediately, but it turned out later when the news was reporting on this incident and on this person who did it, <clears throat> they eventually did say he was a Christian. OK, mm -hmm. so my argument ever since has been to say to people, would you blame all Christians for what this man did? Mm -hmm. And of course, their answer is, well, no, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> you know, it's obvious that it's not all Christians. And even right. it's obvious that you can't even say, well, it's all fundamentalist Christians, mm -hmm. you know. Or it's all evangelical Christians, or it's all ecumenical Christians, whatever label you want to put mm -hmm. with the Christians to make it a mm -hmm. subset, <laughs> okay? Right. You can't even say that. Now, God gave everyone free will. And so we have Torah-oriented Jews. And by the, Jew by the way, Jews are either ethnically Jewish, mm -hmm. meaning genetically, or they converted and joined, you know, the nation of Israel. OK, so some are genetically Jewish and some are not. But the bottom line is everyone has free will. So you have what you might call the pious Jews, the religious mm -hmm. Jews, if you want to use that term, fundamentalist, whatever you want, right. who believe in the Torah and believe in abiding by God's law, God's mm -hmm. word, which, of course, the Romans wanted to take away anyway and say, right. you know, it's done away with. But we'll get back to that. So you have these individuals who 
believe in God's law. They don't believe in murder of any kind, whether abortion or killing someone mm -hmm. because they're having an abortion. I mean, they don't believe in any of that. And then you have people who may be genetically Jewish, you know, born of a Jewish mother, right. who also have free will, who are making choices that are not consistent with God's word. Well, how can all, even if that were true, that there are a lot of Jews in Hollywood or a lot of Jews in the media and they, this, that, and the other, whatever people want to say, but you can't blame, a person can't, logic, it's not logical to blame all Jews. Right. Well, this is all, that's right. This is, this is all part of the anti-Semitic tropes that we have seen leveled against the Jews for centuries. I mean, if we go back to the, the um, Black Death, if we go back in history, any time there was an uh, economic downturn, any time there was a, a, a disease or some type of um, uh, uh, plague that, that came into a community, if there were Jews present, the Jews were blamed. And this is why we have to stand up as Christians. We have to object to this. You know, I think back about what happened with Nazi Germany and talk about the ultimate cancel culture in our lifetime. Or, or you know, I wasn't born during the time of the Nazis, but within the last hundred years, I mean, and the, unfortunately, nobody said anything about the Germans. And their attempt to cancel the Jewish community, and I mean literally, as we know that Hitler's goal was to annihilate the Jews, it was to solve the Jewish question, the Jewish problem. Um, this, is, this is all part and parcel. We see it happening, unfolding again. So when we see people like Kanye West and others who have the platform, who have the ability to influence millions of people, 31 million followers for this guy, and he makes these statements, and then he's shocked. You know, and, and on top of that, look at the other people that are siding with him. You know, Candace, Candace um, Owens, I was really disappointed with her comment um, trying to, you know, um, sugarcoat what Kanye had done and telling people, well, if you really want to be honest with yourself, you would know that this was not anti-Semitic. Well, unfortunately, Candace, you, you haven't done your homework on what anti-Semitism is. And had you done your homework, you would have said, whoa, Kanye, uh, you need to walk that back and you need to apologize because you're falling into the same anti-Semitic tropes and narratives that we've seen leveled against our Jewish brethren for centuries. Right. Now, now let's go back to the Nazis for just a minute. You know, what they did was they took anti-Semitism that was in Europe anyway. It had been in Europe for a while. Mm -hmm. And he actually used the writings of a um, late uh, fourth century, no, early fourth century, late third century uh, writer, John Chrysostom. Yeah. And he was born in Gold Antioch, Zag. Turkey. Mm -hmm. Chrysostom. And he was very anti-Semitic in what he things that he wrote. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what Hitler did was because he wanted to, you know, bring all the Germans and other peoples together against the Jews, really mainly against the Jews. People have to read Mein Kampf mm -hmm. and they'll see this. Okay. But he made it instead of religious anti-Semitism, racial mm -hmm. anti-Semitism. Okay. He made it based on race rather than religion and then he added all other non-aryan people so they killed gypsies okay people from romania they killed africans mm -hmm. and jews they killed people who were elderly people who were you know um sick okay yep. they killed people that they classified as inferior mm -hmm. to the aryan race Mm -hmm. Okay, again, with a major focus on the Jewish people. Now, what was John Chrysostom's theology? It was called, it's called supersessionist, which right. means other people say replacement theology, that mm -hmm. 
that God has replaced the Jews in mm -hmm. his plans and purposes, even though the Hebrew Bible, of course, is all about the Jews. And they yep. wanted the Hebrew Bible as their backstory for the Romans. They wanted to combine both. They mm -hmm. wanted to change the story, but use the backstory of the ancestors of the Galilean, of, of the Jews who started this whole thing in the first century. Okay, so they wanted their cake and eat it too, as we would say today. But right. what but what he was all about was going against Paul's metaphor in the book of Romans, chapter 11, where it talks about the non-Jews. And again, these are God-fearing people who mm -hmm. come out of paganism, okay, where he talked about the non-Jews being grafted into an olive tree. They did not replace the Jews who were, in the metaphor, the natural branches. And he called the non-Jews the wild branches who were grafted into the olive tree. In other words, they were added to the promises right. of God to the Jews. Mm -hmm. Added to, not replacing them. Okay? Mm -hmm. But replacing with the olive tree under the Greco-Roman culture and change of all of this stuff from the first century, they decided, no, 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 no. And part of this goes back to the Roman Jewish wars. Mm -hmm. The temple had already been destroyed. The mm -hmm. Jews had already been exiled from the land in 135 of the Common Era. So during these 300 years, second, third, early fourth century, okay, late first century, it, during all of this time, the shift was made to go towards the Hellenistic culture, it's also called, okay, Greco-Roman, where mm -hmm. you could have a human being worshipped as God where in the Jewish mindset based on the Torah and all the writings of the prophets and everything in the Hebrew Bible, there's no thought of that at all. A Messiah mm -hmm. is anointed by God as a human being like Moshe, Rabbeinu, like mm -hmm. Moses, mm -hmm. okay, like Aaron, the high priest, like the patriarchs Abraham and Isaac and Jacob were all called anointed. So it's a human being that's anointed by God for a special purpose. That's what it means. Mm -hmm. It never right. meant a human being that would be worshipped by God. Never. Mm -hmm. now, now, exactly. people can believe that, by the way, and it's okay, and it will be okay, because the way the Jewish people look at this, even though we're not allowed, it's very clear in Deuteronomy, we're not allowed this to have an intermediary between mm -hmm. us and God. The non-Jews are allowed. So I really mm. want to make that very clear that according to Jewish theology and Jewish writings, it's called mm -hmm. shituf, which means partnership. That there can be a human being that's in some kind of a partnership with God. And therefore, if people pray to that individual, mm -hmm. okay, God accepts it as indirect, you know, worship of him. Okay, not direct, but indirect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's the way the Jewish people have you know, kind of reconciled that Christianity believes in a human being as God. And of course we don't. So mm -hmm. there can be peace so that there can be shalom. Okay. We don't worry about it. And as far as the identity of Mashiach, there, I don't know if I've ever said this to you before about the, the funny thing they say when uh, Mashiach arrives, Right. He's going to be on the Mount of Olives. Did I have said that to you before? <laughs> no, you have not. But I, I, I think I know where you're heading with this. <laughs> okay. So the Jewish people say when Mashiach, when the king, Mashiach ben David, comes, and he's going to be on the Mount of Olives, okay? And they're going to send the mayor of the city of Jerusalem with an entourage, you know, of people, whatever, to go and greet him and escort him through the Golden Gate into the old city, okay? Right. And so they do that and they get up to the top of the Mount of Olives and everybody gets introduced and whatever. And the mayor says to the Mashiach, now we're going to escort you, you know, down through the Kidron Valley and through the Golden Gate and into the old city. But 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 before we do that, I just have one question. Have you ever been here before? <laughs> <laughs> and then so the, the, oh, that's the good. thing is, the thing that's is, so good. then we'll find out. Right. OK. But in the meantime, why why fight about it? Why argue That's right. about it? That's exactly what I say. You know what? We both have a sa the same love for the same God, and you know when he when he comes, whether it's my dear late Rabbi Rabbi Doctor Gerald Meister, 
used to say to me, when he arrives, I'll ask him, is this your first trip or your second? And if he says it's my second, he says, oh, so I'll accept him. So I'll recognize him. But but can't we can't we work together? Can't we unite together? And, you know, the prophet Isaiah foretold um, for our audience, the prophet Isaiah foretold that this day would happen. And it's in chapter 11. So I want to encourage our audience to read chapter 11. But he talks about how one day that um, that Ephraim will stop being jealous of Judah and Judah will stop vexing Ephraim. And they will unite together, and they will make war against the enemies coming against Israel. And I believe that's exactly what is happening. And we do need to we need to respect one another and love one another and work together to bring the light of Torah to the nations of the world, because truly that's when there is going to be peace. And we're going to worship him, Hashem, on his holy mountain anyways, um, during the feasts and the festivals, because he says that if you don't come, any nation that doesn't come, he's going to withhold rain from their their land. So we, we have a very positive, hopeful future. Right now, it looks bleak, but we got to work together. That's all. That's my, those are my thoughts, my comments. Well, I agree. We have to work together for what's right and good for the people. Right. Okay. And some of the stuff that's going on is, you know, we'll get back to that uh, with cancel culture and what people mm-hmm. are doing to each other on social media and in the regular mainstream media and all over mm-hmm. the place. It's just not right. Because in the United States, and and of course, I'm an American citizen as well as an Israeli citizen, and I was born in the U.S. and grew up in the U.S. So the thing is, in the United States, the founders, and I know you're very keen on the founders as well, Mm -hmm. it was very, very important to them that people have freedom of religion. Mm -hmm. And maybe we can talk about that next week if you like. Okay, because I've been reading up about this, about the founders and why they were so keen on this. What happened to them? Mm -hmm. What what was it that made them so insistent? Okay, so we can do that. But I want to go back to the cancer culture in the time of the Romans to say the following. I have a hunch because there's a lot of fear today Mm -hmm. about cancel culture and about it, semitism, not just for the Jews, because see, Jews are called the canary in the coal mine. Right. Okay. If the canary starts laying down and has trouble breathing, it's it's a sign, okay, for the human being. You better get out of there. So anti-Semitism, when it rears its ugly head, anti-anything, hatred of a people simply because they're an ethnic people, they're religious people of mm-hmm. a certain kind, whatever it is. Those people have the same freedom of choice, of religion, of speech, of everything, as long as they're not harming anyone else, and as long as they're not breaking any laws, okay, they should be left alone and not hated and not discriminated against and not persecuted and the other even worse stuff. Right. It's not right. And so Christians and Jews need to work together to show people the way because they've lost their way. They, They get caught up. And all this stuff, but there's a fear today mm-hmm. of this hatred that could turn on me. And when I say me, I don't mean me personally, Yafa. I mean me, whoever is thinking these thoughts. Right. Okay, that a concern of this hatred and cancel culture, everything could be turned on them. And I have a hunch, and I'm trying to see if I can prove it in the early writings. I have a hunch that some people in the Roman, the Greco-Roman world, went along with stuff that they knew was wrong, Mm -hmm. that they knew it was a misinterpretation, a reinterpretation, a distortion of the early first century writings, Mm -hmm. okay, to make it mean something else. And I think it was because of the fear of Roman rule, the perception of the power of the Roman gods the power of the Roman magistrates, the excessive use of propaganda as well as censorship that they did if they felt threatened, if they felt that the Roman imperial cult was threatened. The vicious, brutal cancer culture of those days 
dealt to anyone found to be in opposition to Roman rule. I have a hunch, mm. okay, that all of the people in the Levant were fearful of this. And when the tide started to turn, they did not fight it. They mm. did not stand up. They did not say a peep. Right. And it won. Yeah. And it changed everything. Changed the whole world. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we... And for centuries. Yeah, Dietrich Bonhoeffer tried to warn the Christians during the, the Nazi era of this truth. You know, he understood if we don't speak up, if people are silent, not to speak is to speak. There's a, if we, if, if a void has been created, something or someone is going to fill that void. And we see that happening in society today. We have been silent for several generations. We, we didn't speak up when they removed prayer from school. And I, this always, to me, this always goes back to thumbing our, our thumb, our, our nose into the face of God, telling him that, you know, we don't need to have this time of prayer. There was a, the uniqueness of America and de Tocqueville captured this in his writings when he came to America. He wanted to know what was it that made America great. And his conclusion after traveling across the country for nine months was that the reason why America was great was because America allowed their faith and their politics to, to mesh. And when I say that, I mean that he understood that Americans were governed by their faith. And so therefore, if they were governed by their faith, then that would be deter that would determine how they order their service or, or the job that they do, and especially with elected leaders. But unfortunately, we don't have that kind of a culture anymore. And de, de Tocqueville understood in France that Faith and politics would never collide. They would never mesh. And that was what made us unique. That's why our children did start a day with prayer. And I understand that there are, you know, different prayers. And, you know, now we're into this whole place where we um, didn't want to be. But if we tell God we don't need his blessing, then he will remove his hand from our nation. If we want to try to do it on our own, like we've basically told him, he's stood back and he's allowed all of our, in fact, we can go to the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 28 and we can see what happens to the nation of Israel when he spoke to the nation of Israel. It's a great example to remind us as a Judeo-Christian nation, if we turn our backs on God and we start doing these things, can we expect what he did to Israel to happen to the United States of America? Well, I would suggest that he, he has, and we're, we're paying, we're reaping the consequence of our choices. And ungodliness has come in. We've been silent for too long. Now, silence means consent also. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And there's a law in uh, the Jewish Torah um, that makes this very clear. A daughter under the authority of her father in the home can make a vow. This is all about vows and oaths, mm -hmm. okay, which we're not supposed to make at all, to be honest with you. But if she makes it, okay, and the father hears it in the day she makes the oath and he remains silent, it means he consents and he can't later cause right. her to go against the vow mm -hmm. because he remains silent. So the silence is taken as consent. And I believe that's where that phrase comes from. Mm -hmm. Silence is consent. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if people are silent about what's going on today in the United States, whatever mm -hmm. that happens to be. <laughs> okay. I'm right. not lobbying for any particular, you know, issue. 
But if they're unhappy about what's going on in the schools or what's going on with cancel culture, people canceled, you know, from Twitter and these mm -hmm. other accounts because they have a different political position they want to propose, whatever it happens to be, okay, and yet in the United States under the Constitution, we're supposed to have free speech, which mm -hmm. is why a lot of people are glad that Elon Musk is now head of Twitter. But the thing well, is, we have to speak up. And have dialogue, have respectful dialogue, mm -hmm. but let our views be known to fight against what we think would be damaging either to our children, for example, right. in the schools or to mm -hmm. society at large. Anti-Semitism is a danger to everyone, That's not right. just the Jews. Okay. And this cancel culture is damaging potentially mm -hmm. to everyone and to anyone. And you know who does it? And I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna give names, so I'm just gonna mention a category of people. It's called the elites. Mm -hmm. And it comes out of their arrogance that they are entitled, they have the entitlement to cram down people's throats anything they want. That's, That's right. not what the United States was all about 200 years ago, and it shouldn't be about that today. No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Wow. Yaffa, of course, it's always wonderful having you on the program. As we are closing the program, are there any additional comments or thoughts you want to share with our audience? Next week, we are going to continue the conversation with Yaffa, and we're going to talk about our the framers of our Constitution, our founders, um, our founding documents, you know, these are all important issues that we need to be educated and informed about. And we weren't taught this in school, unfortunately. We weren't taught about Haim Solomon, um, who bankrolled the American Revolution. Um, we weren't taught, we, we don't talk about how George Washington confronted the issue of anti Semitism by assuring the members of the, the synagogue in Newport, Rhode Island the Toro Synagogue, that they would, he quoted from the book of Isaiah, telling them that they'd sit under their own vine and fig tree. So there's so much about our history and our connection to Almighty God and to our Jewish brethren. And unfortunately, we've lost that. But, but Yaffa, give us some closing comments about our conversation today. And um, we will look forward to having you again next week. Okay, well, I just want to quote what that John 844 verse is about, the Gospel of John, which was just mentioned briefly on that banner hanging mm -hmm. from the uh, overpass on uh, 405 in Los Angeles. John 844 has Jesus calling people the synagogue of Satan. Right. Now, in context, and this is a lot of the problem of things being taken out of context, he was a Jew. Mm -hmm. He was arguing with other Jews about things within Judaism. And just to give you a, a very, you know, short explanation, what he was actually saying was anyone who is doing the will of his father in heaven, mm -hmm. okay, is son of God, is a child of God. Mm -hmm. And anyone who's doing the will of the opposite entity, okay, mm -hmm. which is called Satan or Satan in the Hebrew or the devil or whatever, mm -hmm. is a child of the devil. And if mm -hmm. they're congregating in a in a meeting or in a, with a bunch of people in a place called the synagogue, it could be called legitimately the synagogue of Satan. So he's talking about people who are transgress transgressing the Torah. He's right. not talking about all Jews and all of Judaism. Now, when people read just a verse like that or a reference to it on a banner hanging from an overpass, they go look it up mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they don't read it in context and they don't read the whole of all of the, you know, first century writings in context. Right. Okay. They can think it means all Jews. Yes. That he's disavowing Jews and Judaism and he's becoming, I don't know what they think he became. But right. That's not what's going on. And that is a huge, huge problem mm -hmm. with a lot of people in Christianity. 
they do not read their own Bible. They don't read what Christians call the Old Testament. They don't read what they call the New Testament either. And they don't read things in context. And they don't get on the internet and search for articles about these things to read the opinions of the scholars, which mm -hmm. is what I'm doing for my book, by the way. Mm -hmm. They don't they don't do any of that. And I know people are busy and they have families and they have jobs and da 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 da. But if they take it, just those few words, and then use it to harm people because they don't even understand what they're saying, that is not pleasing the Father either. No, no, absolutely not. There's a great scripture that I refer to um, when responding to Christians who buy into this notion, who take New Testament scriptures, take them out of context, and use them against the Jews— there is a um, there's a book, the prophet Obadiah, who God said in the last days he was going to wipe out the descendants of Edom because they stood by while their brother Jacob, the Jews, were held in captivity and they did nothing. Well, standing by and allowing the Nazis to run roughshod to m murder, mutilate our Jewish brethren and not speak up. God was watching to see who would. And judgment comes to those people. You know, people don't think about what the prophets foretold and said would happen. But Obadiah was very specific. He spoke about those Edom, those descendants of Edom, who were alive in the last days. So if they're on this earth in the last days, and they're, those are the people that are going to stand by and do nothing, we need to ask ourselves, ladies and gentlemen, are we Edom? Are we who the prophet was told by Almighty God that he would wipe out because we stood by? Or our ancestors in Germany stood by and allowed six million men, women, and children to be slaughtered? Are we going to stand by again? This is the question, ladies and gentlemen, we have to ask ourselves. We can pull New, Test New Testament scriptures out of, you know, out of our hat and quote them all day long. But you better be sure that you're not going to be accounted or counted among those descendants of Edom in the last days, because you will be judged. There were people who did fight the Nazis and who saved Jews and, and you know, hid them in their mm -hmm. homes, in their farms, yeah. wherever. And they are acknowledged at Yad Vashem in Jerusalem yeah. as yeah. the righteous among the nations. They were righteous. They knew it was wrong what the Nazis were doing, and they stood up. They didn't just speak up. They stood up, and they tried to save the Jews whenever they could or if they could. Yes. So there's both sides here. There's the yeah. people who do nothing and say nothing, and there is judgment for that. But there's also judgment in the sense of rewards, okay, mm -hmm. and kudos, if you will, yeah, that's for, those, for right. those people who have the, the courage, the guts, the whatever you want to call it, to mm -hmm. stand up and do the right thing and say the right thing. Yeah, that's our PJTN Watchmen. I'm so proud of all of our members because they're all standing up and joining forces, locking arms to defend our Jewish brethren, the state of Israel, against this rise of global anti-Semitism. Well, Yafa, it's always great to have you on the program. Thank you so much. I can't wait to talk about um, another favorite topic of mine, and that's our founders next week and cancel culture. So God bless you. Have a great week. And ladies and gentlemen, in closing, I just, I want to thank you all for joining us on the program today. I hope you found this interesting and, and enlightening because these are important issues that we have to address in our generation. I hope you'll share this with, our, with your family and friends. As watchmen, we have a biblical mandate, as we just talked about, to stand against the ungodly rising Marxist threat that is destroying this nation 
and other Western nations and threatening our Judeo-Christian values and promoting anti-Semitism. We cannot remain silent. God warned the prophet Ezekiel about the responsibility of the watchman, and as watchman, you sound you can sound the alarm and warn others just by simply sharing this podcast with your family and friends. So please share and like this podcast to help sound the alarm in your community. And as we talked about, Dietrich Bonhoeffer reminded us that silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. And don't forget to join us for next week's podcast as we continue this conversation about combating the rise of anti-Semitism and taking back local control of our communities and our children's education. I also want to remind you that if you have not signed up to become a PJTM Watchman, now's the time. You can help support this effort and also support more programs like this one for just $20 a month. With your generous monthly donation, you can ensure that PJTN remains on the front lines and in the headlines. But we can't do it without your faithful prayers and your financial support. So I hope that you will prayerfully consider supporting our mission as we educate, activate Jews, Christians, and all people of conscience to stand on the front lines of this all-encompassing war. God bless you and thank you for all you do on behalf of our Jewish brethren the state of Israel, and these United States. Thank you again for joining me on this edition of Proclaiming Justice. Please share this podcast with your family and friends. For more information about how you can get involved, please visit our website at pjtn.org. As a PJTN watchman, you can help us keep up the fight to preserve our freedom for our children and their children for such a time as this.